welcome to Spirit of Hope United Church. It is the 27th of December. We are still not able to gather as a uh, in-person congregation, but we are nonetheless a community of faith uh, that is able to be with each other, uh, thanks to the wonders of the internet, and to our, our hearts that are united in community. As we gather today, I want to acknowledge with respect the history and the spirituality of the people of Treaty 6 and, uh, and their culture and the territory on which our church resides. Uh, we are treaty people, all of us, whether we are of indigenous or of immigrant or, or other heritage. We need to honor our place as treaty people. We honor and respect the heritage and the gifts of the Métis who have been part of this land for, for a long time. We accept our responsibilities, all of us, as treaty members, and we are grateful to share this place today. If you go to the church's website, spiritofhope.ca, on the news and events page, you can find an order of service for today. Uh, you'll also find there uh, an announcement uh, newsletter, The Spark, and uh, there's lots of information there about the life and work of our church. Um. Good morning. My name is Chris Meinzer, and I chair the leadership team. This is an official notice of a congregational meeting to be held on January 10th, 2021 at 11.30 a.m. after the Sunday morning service. The purpose of this meeting is to review and consider approval of our planned renovation design, scope, and budget. Depending on government restrictions on meetings, this meeting may have to be held by online Zoom meeting only. The Zoom meeting login information has been included in an all-member mail-out and will be available in the Spark and on the church website at spiritofhope.ca. Thank you. Let's take time to center ourselves, to light candle, and remind ourselves that we are blessed people because we are a people of God. Amen. The light shines in the world, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let us rejoice in the glowing light of God's love as it surrounds us, envelops us, and centers us. Amen. O come, let us adore. O come, let us celebrate. O come, let us worship. O come, let us be in awe. And let's pray. Holy God, you are gentle and strong, mysterious and known, be with us today. Amen. You're finally here. Let's go home. It's late for supper. I want to see Muttles' new machine. You'll see it another time. It's getting late. Quiet, woman, before I get angry. Because when I get angry, even flies don't dare to fly. I'm very frightened of you. After we finish supper, I'll thank you. Well then, I'm the man in the house. I'm the head of the family. And I want to see Mottle's new machine now! Now let's go! Well, I guess Tevye felt he'd waited long enough. You know, Christmas often involves gift giving and exchanging. Uh, what's your tradition? Or, uh, are you the the kind who opens your presents on Christmas Eve or on Christmas morning? Or do you get them the second they arrive uh, at the house? You know, I knew a family growing up where their particular tradition was that everybody sat down and had breakfast together on Christmas morning before they went to tearing up any wrapping. Patience. Patience is the talent of waiting well to allow that waiting to excite us, to allow us to be ready for the moment when it arrives. 
know, I want to learn myself to be a little bit more patient at waiting. So that when the waiting is over, it's like, wow, wow. I know there's things that all of us are, 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 are wishing would come faster. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff we can't control. And so we're forced to be patient. But to wait well is to allow ourselves to enjoy the moment we're in, at the same time being hopeful and open to the promises of things that will come. Let's pray. Gracious God, help me be a good, patient, waiting person. Let me enjoy the moment I'm in, and let me look forward to all that can be. Amen. This first reading is taken from Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. 
the second reading is taken from Luke 2, verses 22 to 40. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Away in a manger, no clear for a bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky looked down where he
my true love sent to me A partridge in a pear tree On the second day of Christmas My true love sent to me Two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree On the third day of Christmas My true love sent to me Three French hens, two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree On the fourth day of Christmas My true love sent to me My true love sent to me five gold rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me six geese and laying five gold rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Christmas, my true love sent to me Seven swans are swimming Six geese are laying Five gold rings Four calling birds Three French hens Two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree On the eighth day of Christmas My true love sent to me Eight maids are milking Seven swans are swimming Six geese are laying Five gold True love sent to me Nine ladies dancing Eight maids are milking Seven swans are swimming Six geese are laying Five gold rings Four calling birds Three French hens Two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree On the tenth day of Christmas My true love sent to me Ten lords are leaping Nine ladies dancing Eight maids are milking Seven swans are swimming Six geese are laying On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love sent to me Eleven pipers piping, ten lords are leaping Nine ladies dancing, eight maids are milking Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying Five gold rings, four calling birds Three French hens, two turtle doves And a partridge in a pear tree On the twelfth day of Christmas, my true love sent to me Ten lords are leaping, nine ladies dancing, eight maids are milking, seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, five gold rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Many of us know about the existence of the 12 days of Christmas because of the song. Uh, outside of a strict adherence to uh, the liturgy of a formal church calendar, uh, a number of churchgoers, and definitely the wider culture that we are a part of, see the Christmas season as the weeks that lead up to December 25th. This is when we see the public displays of seasonal decorations. This is when Christmas music takes over a radio station or two when the Hallmark-style movies dominate TV. You know, sometimes this Christmas season lasts for a few days after Christmas Day, but often by the 27th, for many people, Christmas is over. Those of us who are active in a church that follows, to some degree, a liturgical calendar we're familiar with the pre-Christmas season of Advent, a time of preparation, a time of anticipation that, among other things, forces us to wait for Christmas. As Spirit of Hope, we lit a new candle each week on our Advent wreath to mark a progression through that pre-Christmas season. You know, I don't think there's been an Advent season in all of my 31 years of ordained ministry 
when I have not heard someone in the particular congregation that I was serving at the time that said that they were disappointed that we weren't singing more Christmas carols in church in December. It is hard to buck the wider trend that the Christmas season begins in early December. The official Christmas season, on church calendars at least, runs from December 25th through January 5th. A season of 12 days that begins with Jesus' birth and leads us to the day of Epiphany, which is January 6th, when the story is told of the visit of the Magi, those wise ones who came bearing gifts. A bit of an aside here, you know, it's only on Christmas cards in some decorative manger scenes and in the occasional Christmas pageant that the Magi, the wise ones, show up on the day that Jesus is born. Uh, that's not a scene that's actually found anywhere in the Bible. In fact, it's a fair reading of Matthew chapter 2, where we read about the Magi, to presume that Jesus could have been up to two years old by the time that they arrived with their gifts. More on that next week. You know, I did my best not to rush to the manger during the Advent season, and so I'm not going to rush to find gold and frankincense and myrrh this early into the 12 days of Christmas. For today, Luke's Gospel carries on the Christmas story, the story of Jesus' birth for about another month or so. And that allows us to journey with Joseph and Mary and their baby as they participate in two very specific and particular rituals that were part of their culture. First, when Jesus was eight days old, he was circumcised, um, shown to be a, a member of the Hebrew family, and he was formally named Yehoshua. Yehoshua, which if we translated into Aramaic, becomes Yeshua. That would have been the name Jesus heard when people talked to him throughout his life, Yeshua. And then if we transliterate it into Greek, the language of the New Testament, we get Jesus. And then if we turn that into Latin, we get Jesus. And finally, with an English pronunciation of those Latin letters, we end up with Jesus. In our language, we would say that on the eighth day, they named him Jesus. Yehoshua, God saves, Yahweh saves. And then the second ritual we heard about this morning, when 33 days had passed, Mary went to the temple for the rite of purification that women uh, took part in following the birth of a child. It was all according to Levitical law. Both of those actions were done to be faithful to Leviticus chapter 12, which reads that if a woman conceives and bears a male child, she shall be unceremonial clean, unceremonial clean for seven days, as at the time of her menstruation she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, her time of blood purification shall be 33 days. She shall not touch any holy thing or come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are completed. She shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent meeting a, a lamb in its first year for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. The priest shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement on her behalf. Then she shall be clean from her flow of blood. She cannot afford a sheep. She shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for the burnt offering and one for the sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement on her behalf, and she shall be clean. Now, setting aside the sense that simply giving birth makes someone uh, un incapable of connecting with God is, is, is a, a debate that we can have about ancient cultures and practices. As I mentioned on, on Christmas Eve, the fact that the text of Luke mentions that Mary 
brought two birds for the sacrifice instead of the usual lamb and bird, tells us that she and Joseph were classified as poor. They couldn't afford the larger offering. Some of the key things that we can make note of from the days after Jesus' birth in this Luke passage are one, that, that Mary and Joseph were, were righteous followers of their faith. They were practices of cultural tradition. And that would provide their children, this, this regular practice of faith, would provide their children with a connection to their national and to their religious story. Jesus would grow up knowing that he is part of the grand Hebrew narrative of faithfulness that included Sarah and Abraham, Moses and Miriam and Aaron, Ruth, Kings David and Solomon, Jeremiah, Esther, the Maccabees, and, and more. As well, Jesus knew through his family what it was like to live day to day, to live paycheck to paycheck, so to speak. And this would have engendered in Jesus a good work ethic, a keen eye to notice each moment's opportunity. I think it would have engendered in him an appreciation for the gifts of hospitality, the value of a good meal, and a real sense of celebration when a banquet was offered. And Jesus would have grown a deep understanding of the reality of an honest need and a call of justice for the poor. Now that's a lot to read in to a few missing days that followed Jesus' birth, but we have the totality of the full gospel record to confirm this is how Jesus turned out. Today's reading from Luke tells us about two insightful people whose faith and sixth sense told them that this child was going to be a force of change and inspiration, as the Apostle Paul would phrase it some 55 years or so later, that he would redeem people as children and heirs of God. First, there was Simeon, a man who believed that he could now die happy because he glimpsed the child Jesus, and that was like catching a look at God's messianic salvation. And as Simeon held one-month-old Jesus in his arm, he, he told Mary that her child was destined to be involved in the transformation of many lives. And that although his time might be challenging to some, he would point people to the truth. Then there was Anna, a fixture of a person at the temple for decades. To the pilgrims, she was viewed as a prophet of sorts, revered for her faithfulness and her steadfast dedication. And after she saw Joseph and Mary in the temple, Anna began to include Jesus in her sermons about the redemption of the people. Sometimes, like Simeon and Anna, we get hints of a blessing to be. And there is value in appreciating those small things that point us towards something more. The events of Jesus' first month were filled with both this backward-looking historical significance and the forward-looking hope and promise. On his eighth day, Jesus was named after a hero of the faith, after Moses' successor, Joshua, Yehoshua. Joshua was the one who ushered the Israelites from nomadic living into a settled life in a new land. And then on his 33rd day, Jesus looked into the eyes of elders who insightly saw God's redemption and salvation through this new life. These are hints of blessings to come, even as the path of life is honored and celebrated in the moment. Let's not move too quickly through these days of the Christmas season. Let them resonate. 
time is going to march on soon enough on its own. Already our northern hemisphere days are growing slightly longer with each new sunrise. Lockdowns are showing some signs of easing some of the burdens of the COVID pandemic. People are beginning to get vaccinated. The lights that we shined together on a silent Christmas Eve night still glow and show us the way. Like Jesus, let's take moments as they come. Neither rushing through and evading their significance, but also not getting stuck in the here and now. Let's grow our wisdom. Let's grow our patience. But let's grow. Time is going to march along soon enough on its own. By this time next week, we will have welcomed a new month, filled with the hope and the promise that we long for at each turning of the year. Over these 12 days of Christmas, let us rest as we are able. Let us work as we should. Let us pray as we can. And let us love as we are. Thanks be to God, uh, for we are not alone. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the days at hand. May we take time to reflect on your presence in the world. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh God, our creator, our hope and our life. We pray for all that you give us, for all that you are. We bring you our praise. A life of gratitude is our gift to you for coming to us as a human child, for pouring into the world your hope, your peace, your joy, and your love. And those who came to worship and adore the newborn babe in Mary's arms, we like them now worship you, light of the world. Come to us anew and fill our hearts with love. We pray, God, that this love will be shown in how we treat each other, in the care that we offer, in the compassion that we feel, in the justice we seek. Be with each one as they need you right now. Let us pray a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer and find meaning for today. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For your reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Today's Minute for Mission concerns fighting human trafficking. The Diocese of Durgapur, of mission and service partner, the Church of Northern India, has a vision, transforming communities, changing lives. Since 2011, the diocese has been doing just that with the anti-human trafficking program in North and South Dinajapur districts. These areas are both sources and transit points for human trafficking. Two key parts of the prevention strategy are training youth, children, and their guardians to recognize human trafficking and teaching them ways to protect themselves and help others from being trafficked. The primary reason for trafficking is poverty. Traffickers lure parents with promises of education, a better life, and money. In some cases, parents are given cash in return for sending their children to the traffickers. But instead of the better life promised, children are put to work in brick kilns or carpentry units or as domestic servants, indentured laborers, beggars, or sex trade workers. Traffickers are also involved in harvesting organs. Through the Diocese of Durgapur, the Church of North India organizes awareness sessions with community leaders, guardians, and youth who may be directly approached by traffickers. The training includes sharing stories from trafficking victims, as well as making them aware of the laws intended to protect victims and prosecute traffickers. Through a growing network of community relationships, the diocese works with local leaders and authorities to stop this abhorrent trade. Your gifts to mission and service help save adults and children from being trafficked. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. Grateful for all that we give and receive, let us pray. God of abundance, we offer what we can to serve the mission and ministry of our Christ. 
guide us, and help us to be your faithful followers. Amen. surrounds you this day and forevermore. Amen.